This is the complete roadmap to becoming a full-stack software engineer in 2025. We'll cover everything from AI tools to cloud services, system design, performance optimization techniques, security, and much more. At the end, you can also grab the free copy of this roadmap to keep track of your progress. As for the prerequisites, this roadmap assumes that you have the foundational skills from front-end and back-end development, but if not, then you can check out my front-end and back-end development guides first before diving in. Let's start with AI tools. If you're not using AI tools in this day and age, then you're missing out big time and developers will eventually be replaced, not by AI tools, but by developers who are using these AI tools. At the very least, you should be using the basic AI tools like ChatGBT, Cloud AI, or Google's Gemini and DeepSeek for generating boilerplate code or suggesting optimizations and detecting errors. Then we have also Copilot tools, things like GitHub's Copilot or Tab9, which are AI assistants that provide you auto-suggestions while you're writing your code, and it will also improve your speed and accuracy by using this. On the next level, there are advanced AI code editors, things like Cursor AI or Windsurf Editor. These editors can generate boilerplate code just like these other AI tools, but they can do it with the context of your code, which is much more helpful, and they can also help you fix bugs and develop new features in your application. Then we have AI-powered project generators that can generate projects with your single prompt. These are tools like V0, which helps you to create a Next.js application with a single prompt, and then you can iterate over it to make it specifically as you want it to be. And you can even deploy it instantly from their platform and have it running instantly. These are just a couple of the tools that you should be using in your day-to-day -day coding tasks. There are also more like automated documentation AI assistants or AI that can be integrated in CI-CD pipelines to enhance the deployment processes and much more. And if you don't want to get left behind, then you can check out my upcoming AI developer course. By the time you're watching this, it might already be available. So check out the tools and techniques that you should be using to speed up your development and stay ahead of the curve. Next topic that we have are data structures and algorithms. You might have skipped this at the beginning of your journey since you were mostly working at front-end development or maybe back-end development, but you haven't touched data structures and algorithms in too detail. But you should at least have a strong grasp of the basics like what are the big O notation, what are hash tables, trees and graphs, because these are also things that are used in real world applications behind the scenes like in SQL databases or in MongoDB and you might not even realize it. From basics we also have traversing like traversing over a tree or graph, recursion algorithms, sorting strategies, dynamic programming, and for practice, I recommend you use LeetCode. For practicality, I only recommend you solve easy to medium problems. You don't need any more than like hard problems because these are not even asked during the interviews. If you can confidently solve the medium problems on LeetCode, then that's more than enough. Next topic after this, we have testing. Testing ensures that our applications and projects stay reliable and also stable. Here you can learn about different types of testing and also the tools that are used for each type. For example, first level we have unit and integration testing. Unit testing is more like testing single units of your code, like the functions. And integration tests are more like testing the integration between different components in your code, like different components in your React application or different components in your backend application. For the tools here, the most popular ones are Jest and Vtest. And we also have Mocha and Chai, which are still popular, but the more popular options here are Jest and Vtest. Then we have end-to-end -end testing. End-to-end -end tests simulate the real user interactions to ensure that you have the complete functionality. For example, you might write an end-to-end -end test to test the login flow of your application or to test the checkout process of your application. So here tools like Cypress and Playwright will be used and they will go through the flow, like they will go to the login page, they will type the login credentials that you have provided and they will check whether the flow works as expected or if you have some issues then they will let you know in advance. Next we also have API testing with tools like Postman. 
As an alternative, you can also write it with Newman, and there are also other alternatives, but Postman is the most popular one. And these tests will help you validate the RESTful and GraphQL APIs and make sure that your endpoints produce the expected outcomes. The other type of testing is performance testing with tools like GMeter or K6. With these tools, you can analyze the application performance under heavy load. You can simulate heavy load on your application. For example, you can send thousands of users to your application and you can make many concurrent requests and see how your application behaves under the heavy load. And the last one is more of a methodology, which is test-driven development. This is the practice of first writing the tests of your application and how you're expecting it to behave, and then writing the code to fix the failing tests. The next topic that you can focus on after testing is design patterns. These patterns help us to write more maintainable and reusable code. And generally, there are three main categories that you can divide this into. First category is creational patterns. Here we have things like singleton or factory pattern. These help us manage the object creation effectively. Then we have structural patterns, for example, proxy or facade patterns, which help us to simplify the complex code structures. And lastly, we have behavioral patterns like observer or iterator, which help us to improve the communication between objects. And based on the type of the application and also which parts you are working on, you will use different types of these patterns. So if you're familiar with all of the main patterns, then it will help you to know when and how to use each pattern in real world applications. After design patterns, we also have cloud services topic. Cloud computing is sometimes the most cost efficient way because you pay as you scale and a lot of companies are using and relying on these cloud services, things like AWS, which is the most popular one, but we also have Azure and Google Cloud provider. If you're going to start from one of these or you're going to learn only one, then I recommend you start with AWS. All of these services also come with their compute services. Services like EC2 where you can host your applications or Lambda functions, which is called Lambda in AWS, but it's called in different ways in Azure or Google Cloud. But the idea is the same. You write a function and then you execute it on demand. All of these cloud services also come with their storage solutions, things like S3 and Blob Storages, and they also provide their own databases, SQL and NoSQL. For example, AWS also offers you DynamoDB, or Azure offers you Cosmos DB, and so on. So just get familiar with the databases and storage solutions of the cloud service that you choose. And overall, learn about serverless architectures, things like how do you reduce infrastructure management with using serverless computing. Most companies also use CI-CD pipelines to streamline their software development by automating test and deployment processes. CI-CD stands for Continuous Integration and Continuous Deployment. The key topics here are the environments, the environments where your application is running, most of the medium to large companies have more than one environments, and it's common to name them as dev environment for development purposes, staging environment for testing the application, and production environment, which is for the end users. Then learn about the CI-CD pipelines on different platforms. The most popular one is by doing it with GitHub Actions, but we also have another popular option, which is Jenkins, and also GitLab, which comes with its CI-CD solution. The idea in all of these cases is to automate the code integration and deployment. And now linking back to the testing topic which we discussed, also learn how to use the automated testing in pipelines, which means setting up these tests that you wrote, like unit and integration tests, to be in the pipeline of the CI-CD and run before every deployment to make sure that your code is ready to go to production. And the last topic here that we have is infrastructure as code. These are tools like Terraform or Pulumi. And there are other tools as well, which are for automating the infrastructure setup and management. For building large scale and high performance applications, you will also need to learn about system design, especially if you plan to advance to architectural roles. These are the main concepts that you will need to learn within system design. 
First is the API caching with tools like Redis or Memcached, which are in-memory databases that will help you to add API caching and reduce the latency. Then you can also learn about content delivery networks, which will help you to distribute the content globally for faster load times. If you have knowledge gaps on the networking fundamentals, then this is a good time to revisit it and learn about how the TCP and UDP operate and how to optimize the data transmission. Next topic are the proxy servers. Learn about the forward and reverse type of proxies and most importantly about load balancers, which is the most commonly used type of proxy server. You should also know the difference between monolith and microservice architectures and when to use each of these for scalability and also for fast growth. Another concept here is messaging architecture with tools like Kafka, which is the most popular one, but we also have RabbitMQ or we have SQS, which is the AWS's solution for this messaging architecture. These tools are mostly used for enabling asynchronous communication so that the operations that are not that crucial, you can do them behind the scenes in the background, which will speed up the user interface and also the user experience. Another important concept is database replication and sharding. You should know how to improve database performance and two of the main strategies here are replication and sharding, both for SQL and NoSQL types of databases. And as a bonus point, you can also learn about monorepos, which is the practice of having single Git repository that contains multiple projects, and this way you have code reusability and many other benefits, but also drawbacks. A lot of big companies are using this practice, and a lot of them are not using, so you just need to know the pros and cons of using monorepos, which might be helpful for you in the future. The next topic after system design is learning how to do performance optimization in softwares. Typically you have three main areas to optimize the performance. You have the front-end side, you have the back-end side, and then you have the network part, which is the part in between from front-end to back-end. On the front-end side, the most important concept that you can learn is critical render path. This will help you a lot to optimize the details of your HTML, CSS and JavaScript rendering on the screen. Another strategy is to also minimize your JavaScript and CSS files by using code splitting and lazy loading techniques. And if you're using React or other framework tools, then you can also use efficient rendering like memorization, virtualization for long lists or using the React memo or pure components to prevent the unnecessary re-renders. On the backend side, you can optimize the database by adding indexing and query optimization to reduce the response times. And as we discussed earlier, you can also implement caching on the API layer with tools like Redis for frequently accessed data. And you can use the content delivery networks to reduce the server load and also improve response times for the static assets. For the network part, you should enable compression with tools like gzip for text-based resources to reduce the payload size and this will also reduce the latency. And you can utilize the HTTP 2 or 3 protocols, which offer multiplexing, header compression, and many more features that will help you to reduce the load times. These are just the basics of performance optimizations. You can dive much deeper than this. And the next topic that we have after performance is security. This is another important part of full stack development, because you need to ensure the security of the components in your system. And let's start by discussing the API security. Here the most fundamental security measures are implementing rate limiting and adding course headers. Also managing tokens properly and OAuth to secure your APIs. From the web security, you can learn about the CSRF and XSS attacks and how to prevent them. And also SQL and NoSQL injections in databases and how to prevent this using ORMs or other tools. The next topic is you should learn about how to implement strong authentication and authorization mechanisms and also how to implement monitoring and logging in your system for tracking security events and detecting anomalies. 
And if you'd like to master all of the topics on this roadmap under my guidance, then you can check out my mentorship program below. And don't forget to grab the free copy of this roadmap to track your progress. Good luck on your journey.